Okay, welcome everybody. We have a great talk today that's uh, going to be presented by uh, Lisa Altamanelli. And uh, the guest host, we have a guest host today again, and that'll be uh, Dr. Linda Ehrlich Jones. So I'm going to pass over the baton to Linda, and she's going to handle the intros as well as the questions at the end. So thank you very much, Linda. You're on. Great. Thanks, Jordan. It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lisa Adamanelli. She is our 2023 Nidler Invited Lecturer for the Rehabilitation Research and Training Center on Employment for Persons with Physical Disabilities. Dr. Adamanelli is a clinical psychologist at the James A. Haley Veterans Hospital and Clinics in Tampa, Florida. She has over 25 years of experience in the Veterans Health Administration, serving veterans with spinal cord injuries and other cognitive and mental disabilities, working with diverse interdisciplinary teams, and advocating for systems change to implement best practices and rehabilitation services. Dr. Adamanelli is a highly productive and successful VA clinician investigator and a faculty member of the University of South Florida. Since 2005, she has been continuously federal funded and her work began with multi-site research studies that adapted the individualized placement and support model of supported employment for the new population and setting of SCI medical rehabilitation. Her current work includes a randomized trial of customized employment and the development of an employment learning collaborative. She's authored more than 50 publications and her work has been translated into professional guidelines, toolkits, and consumer resources. Lisa completed her doctorate in clinical psychology at Texas Tech University and her internship at the University of Oklahoma Health Sciences Center. She's an associate professor in the Department of Rehabilitation and Mental Health Counseling at the University of South Florida. She serves on the governance board of the Academy of SCI Professionals as president of the psychologists, social workers, and counselors section on the Veterans Advisory Council on Rehabilitation. Lisa has been recognized by the prestigious Licht Award for Excellence in Scientific Writing from the American Congress of Rehabilitation Medicine, the Clinical Excellence Award from the Paralyzed Veterans of America, and the S.C. Morgan Excellence Award from the Academy of Spinal Cord Injury Professionals for demonstration and outstanding leadership in the areas of psychosocial adjustment and rehabilitation of persons with SCI. CRAR is able to provide continuing education credit for Dr. Atamanelli's presentation for clinical rehabilitation counselors. We will provide in the chat a link to the evaluation form and who to contact for this process. As part of her role as the Nidler Invited Lecturer, Dr. Atamanelli will be available for consultation on employment. And if you're interested in a consultation, please contact Angelica Kudla, who will provide her contact information in the chat. So please help me welcome Dr. Lisa Adamanelli, who will present on employment for veterans with spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury, evidence-driven approaches. Thank you for that kind introduction, and especially thank you for the opportunity to talk about the topic of employment in spinal cord injury and traumatic brain injury, um, with a particular emphasis on veterans and um, what the research has shown in that area. Um, just in way of uh, disclosures and disclaimers, I um, do not have any disclaimers beyond the um, beyond uh, the funding that I've received from the Department of Veterans Affairs and the Office of Research and Development, and also the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation. And the disclaimer of that standard is that the contents of this presentation do not represent the views of the Department of Veterans Affairs or the United States government. They are my own. So I'd like to start off by talking about spinal cord injury and employment. Are you all seeing my slides? Okay. Um, this group is probably familiar, but in way of background, there's approximately 264,000 individuals in the US that are currently living with a traumatic spinal cord injury and disorders. Over 18,000 new cases are reported annually, and over 15% of these folks receive their health care from a Veterans Health Administration. 
Now, the Veterans Health Administration has the largest spinal cord injury integrated system of care in the world. And the way that it's organized is there are 25 regional spinal cord injury disorder centers throughout the nation. And also there are 122 spokes. And those are designated local SCID primary care teams at VA medical centers. The spinal cord injury disorder system of care also includes six dedicated long-term care centers and provides care throughout the lifespan from acute rehab through discharge all the way throughout the lifespan, um, no matter where the veteran lives and receives their care in the U.S. I won't spend much time here because I think the audience is familiar, but we know that SCI disrupts movement, sensation, and autonomic system function, which of course includes alters reflexes, breathing, bowel and bladder, disruptions in sensation of pain and temperature, and of course, muscle paralysis. And then we also talk about types of injury in terms of whether it involves all four extremities, having impaired motor sensation, um, <clears throat> impaired motor function and sensation, um, with that being tetraplegia and paraplegia being impairment in the chest, abdomen, and lower extremities. Um, so that being the case, um, spinal cord injury and disorders is of course a life altering event. Not only does it involve loss of physical function and independence, but it brings with it a whole host of um, risks for negative psychosocial and health outcomes. These difficulties include secondary health conditions and mortality, greater risk of mental health difficulties, including a higher risk of suicide, disrupted relationships and family life, a lower quality of life, and um, particularly for this pr presentation, less vocational and community reintegration. Um, the good news is that by addressing community reintegration and particularly employment, there is an opportunity to have a positive effect on the other areas of life that are disrupted. So let's take a moment and look at what employment looks like after spinal cord injury. Um, throughout the years, most of the data that we have had has come from the SVI model systems, which as you may know, um, publishes information on employment um, for the general population. As we can see here, there's a slight rise after injury um, but pretty much that plateaus after about year 20. And depending on the study that you look at, it generally hovers around the 35% mark, 30, 35%, depending on the study and the methodology. Um, now, veterans are sometimes treated in the model care uh, system, but they're a minority and they're not necessarily reported separately that I'm aware of. Um, and veterans are a distinct population. Um, in the VA system, which we'll talk about in a moment, we see both veterans that have traumatic and non-traumatic spinal cord injuries, and typically veteran populations are older and have more comorbidities. So in 2020, we published a nationwide survey we did where we interviewed veterans about employment at seven VA spinal cord injury centers um, throughout the system of care. Um, over a thousand veterans participated. At the time of injury, 72% uh, were employed. Um, not unexpectedly, that went down to around that, almost that 30% mark when you looked at post-injury and then you look um, around five years after the, or five years prior to the interview. But at the time of the interview, um, only 9.2% were working. Um, so, pretty low employment rates, um, which is unfortunate given that we know that employment can make a big difference. Um, so I talked a little bit about how the VA does um, spinal cord injury care. I'm gonna talk a little bit about vocational rehabilitation in VA. So I'm talking about the Veterans Healthcare Administration, not the Veterans Benefits Administration, so VHA, not VBA. And when vocational rehabilitation is offered as part of VHA, it is considered a recovery-oriented or clinical service that's part of rehabilitation services, part of healthcare services. So that being the case, um, 
both service connected and non service connected veterans are eligible to receive vocational rehabilitation in um, VHA at VHA medical centers and throughout the VA. Um, it's available for any veteran living with a mental illness or physical impairment that poses a barrier to employment. And the goal of the service is to obtain meaningful community integrated employment. I'll share a little bit about how these services are organized. Um, so underneath VHA vocational rehabilitation, there's basically kind of two boxes. One is just short-term vocational assistance. So that might be like if a veteran just needs help building a resume. Um, the majority of services are presided underneath the local compensated work therapy programs. And these offer a continuum of structured programs, um, including community-based employment services, supported education, supported employment, supported self-employment, and transitional work. The reason why the two services are in green of supported employment and transitional work is because VA policy is that those particular services must be available at every VA medical center and the others may be available depending on location. So I'm gonna focus on supported employment. So um, supported employment is sometimes used as a general term in the VA when you hear the term supported employment, you can know that they're referring to the individual model, <clears throat> individual placement and support model of supported employment. And that is an evidence-based practice guided by core principles. The other feature of this model is that it includes rigorous program evaluation um, with a fidelity scale. So the IPS fidelity scale is a 25 item scale that measures adherence to the core principles, which we'll walk through in a moment. VA also includes um, regular program evaluation that is collected on outcome, collected both on enrollment as well as discharge and outcomes through the Northeast Program Evaluation Center. So let's talk about those principles. So IPS is built around eight principles. The first one being zero exclusion, meaning anybody who is interested in work is eligible to receive services regardless of the severity of their disability, their psychosocial condition or circumstances or any other comorbidities such as substance abuse. Um, a key feature, or I would say cornerstone is that IPS uses an integrated model. So IPS is not something you refer out to, it's something you include with the rest of, of care and I'll, I'll um, illustrate that as we go on. The goal is to help someone find meaningful competitive employment in the community. So not looking for set aside jobs here, but looking for a job where someone is afforded the same opportunity for equal pay, as well as advancement and social inclusion as other employees in an integrated setting. Um, benefits can be a huge barrier for people seeking employment. So IPS pays attention to making sure that people get accurate information about their benefits so they make, can make informed decisions about employment. Um, and basically the approach is to rapidly go out in the community and with the help of a vocational rehabilitation specialist, sometimes called an employment specialist, uh, systematically develop a job that is um, geared around the uh, job seekers preferences skills, interests, and um, abilities. And also, most importantly, provide follow along supports after the job is obtained so that they can hopefully retain that job or switch to a different job if it's not a, a good fit. So I wanna <clears throat> take a moment to look at some of the clinical and research milestones in implementing this evidence-based practice of um, IPS supported employment in the VA. Uh, it, since it was developed for a population of persons with, with serious mental illness, and there were many randomized trials supporting its use um, and establishing it as a evidence-based practice with persons that have um, SMI, the VA first introduced it to that target population in 2004 um, exclusively. So those were the only people in the VA who were um, really receiving IPS supported employment at that time. 
In 2005, um, the randomized clinical trial referred to as the SCI-VIP trial um, established the evidence for supported employment with the SCI population. And we'll walk through that in a moment. That was followed by uh, another five-year study, which was a longitudinal look at um, implementation factors, cost effectiveness, and a deeper dive into quality of life data. So that really solidified the evidence that this practice could be used in SEI and could be effective to achieve positive employment and rehabilitation outcomes. So then in 2019, policy kind of caught up and there were changes that encouraged the extension of supported employment to not only SCI, but to other populations of persons that had complex medical disabilities and psychiatric disabilities, including TBI and um, post-traumatic stress disorder. So I wanna walk you through the trial now um, and what that looked like and what the results were. So um, the SCI VIP trial was a randomized trial of uh, 12 months and 201 unemployed veterans treated in the VA system of care at six VA medical centers participated. 81 were randomized to IPS and 76 were randomized to um, receive treatment as usual for vocational issues. In most cases, that meant a referral outside the SCI center. Um, we included two observational sites where the intervention wasn't introduced and just looked at what that those outcomes looked like over time without interfering with the setting. So for the people who were randomized, they either received IPS that was integrated into SCI rehab. And the way we did that is we hired a vocational rehab specialist and integrated them on the interdisciplinary care team so that they were working alongside the physician and the occupational therapist, physical therapist, recreational therapist, psychologist, social workers, um, to address the veterans employment goals versus those who were referred to whatever was available in that locality for addressing vocational rehabilitation. Um, the outcomes were pretty clearly in favor of IPS. If you compared those who were random at the randomized site, it was two and a half times more effective than um, treatment as usual. And then if you looked at IPS compared to the two sites where the condition wasn't even introduced at that facility, it was 11 times more likely to result in a positive job outcome. We wanted to learn a little bit more about what particular activities were more likely to lead to those good employment outcomes. And um, as part of the work that we were doing, not only to look at this, but with some healthcare cost analysis data, we had our vocational rehabilitation specialists use a template in the electronic health record to document not only what activities they were doing, but how much time they were spending delivering these activities. So for each encounter they had with a veteran, they would um, fill out this. And there was also a narrative where they could write their usual notes. And then we looked at what predicted the likelihood of a job outcome. And what we found were that the services that were less likely to lead to a job outcome were those that could be grouped into categories described as work readiness approaches, more of a stepwise approach where first we're gonna work on this and then we do this and um, office-based approaches. So when a lot of time was spent, maybe in interviewing and case management and general assessment and vocational counseling, that was less likely to lead to, lead to a job placement than when it was more of an employment first approach where it was, let's go out in the community and find something that is um, developed around what's interesting to you and when services were integrated. So when the services were co-occurring co with other services they were having as part of their SCI care and other providers were included. So community-based services in particular, job placement, job development, and providing those supports and follow-up in the workplace were more likely to lead to a positive job outcome. So that was the data from the first trial. The second trial was looking at IPS for a longer period of time um, in a more naturalistic way. We didn't have a comparison group here 
We just wanted to see what would happen over time with repeated measures in a single arm uh, longitudinal observational co cohort of importantly up to two years of IPS being available, which is more like the IPS model is designed because it's supposed to be time unlimited. 213 veterans at seven VA medical centers received IPS as part of their this trial. Um, I want to describe the participants to you. 47% uh, had paraplegia and 53% had tetraplegia. We allowed inpatients to enroll as well as outpatients. Um, a little over a quarter of the sample were enrolled as inpatients. And um, according to the um, Ohio State um, TBI identification measure that we used, um, almost 60% um, like had a had a TBI history, um, which is also not um, unusual for this population. Um, very typically, there were common mental health diagnoses represented in the sample. Up to 35% had depression. Up to 20% had substance abuse. So they were a very typical um, veteran spinal cord injury patient. So there was no cherry picking here for this sample. Um, so if you look at the employment outcomes, even though they had a wide range of disabilities, comorbidities. Um, they all were able to achieve, they were able to achieve a 43% employment rate. So 43% of the sample at large um, had a positive employment outcome. And then if you looked at those who maybe were considered more healthy, so if we just looked at out people who enrolled as outpatients um, who did not have a TBI, it was 52%. Um, it was a mixed method study and on our measures of health related quality of life, life satisfaction and life role, life roles, excuse me, our employed veterans not, did, uh, did better, improved um, compared to um, veterans who did not um, become employed. Interestingly enough, on our qualitative data, um, all our IPS participants reported improved quality of life, productivity, and well-being, and I think um, part of this is that IPS is a you know job seeking itself, but particularly when you receive this level of intensive support, is very hope engendering. Um, so that was the um, remote study, but we also looked a little bit further. So I wanted to just provide some additional information on some of the quality of life data and um, the health economics and implementation data. So um, let's see. So the first study, when we looked at measures that detect quality of life changes in the area of handicap, such as the chart, we did see improvement in social integration, mobility, and occupation. But when we looked at the um, health-related quality of life measure that we used, which was the um, Veterans RAN 36, VR 36, um, it was not sensitive enough to um, show changes in that 12 month study. Um, however, in the 24 month study, um, we saw, saw consistent improvement in chart scores, health related quality of life and life satisfaction. So again, I think that longitudinal data is, is um, very important. Okay, my screen just did something strange, sorry. Okay, we'll go. Forward here. I apologize, my screen did something weird. Okay, here we go. All right, fun technology. Okay, so um, our qualitative data also told us some of the top benefits that veterans reported um, for participating in IPS. Um, they talked about um, contributing to society, setting new goals, improved physical health, income, and improved mental health. Um, so as one veteran said, IPS changed my life. I love getting up in the mornings and I look forward to going to work. This is a gentleman with an incomplete um, SCI. So um, we did include cost effectiveness analysis in both studies. Um, and the bottom line is that IPS is a pretty low cost intervention, particularly if you compare it to other um, typical medical rehabilitation um, costs. So the cost of providing IPS services to a veteran with SCI was 
less than the cost of two hospital days. Um, and the total cost of IPS does not significantly differ from that of usual care. However, IPS outperforms usual care with the two and a half times higher employment rate and significantly greater quality adjusted life years of participants. So that's important to note. So taken together, I, I think it's pretty clear that work is an on-ramp to inclusion, access, and equity, and um, using an evidence-based practice is one way to get there. Um, but using the evidence-based practice is key. And so it's one thing to develop the evidence, it's another thing to implement. Um, so we were able to include some, in, some data um, by gathering qualitative interviews from both providers and veterans about barriers and facilitators to implementing this kind of team-based approach in, in clinical practice. Um, 847 interviews over seven sites over five years gives a, a lot of data. So um, what was interesting is because we did have that time span, we, we were able to look at factors that influence early stage, mid stage, and late state, stage implementation. And they weren't always the same, but the ones that were the same were consistently integration of the vocational specialist and the clinical care team. Um, so having that VRS on the team, so those first two factors point to that. Leadership support, not surprisingly, and engagement of the SCI providers. Mm. As one said, IPS is excellent because you have a well-integrated team which supports the VRS and that's the ticket, that's what works. Um, so going back again to that core principle of integration, it shows up over and over again. Um, and when this practice was included in a VA um, publication that was publishing best practices in an effort, effort to diffuse best practices throughout the VA system, and um, they asked that you outline some of the factors to replicate such programs. So what this meant for this particular program was that if you want a successful IPS program, it's important to outline clear expectations for evidence-based IPS practices, monitoring adherence, that's where that fidelity comes in, and providing feedback for program improvement. I'll give a snapshot of that in a moment. Um, cultivating active and obvious leadership support, um, both at the top down and at the, um, at the provider level or the service level, and promoting seamless collaborative care through broad education about IPS that includes sharing outcomes with staff. Um, we found it was really important to um, facilitate interprofessional education. Um, so I, I sometimes think about um, introducing IPS into SCI rehab is, is almost like an arranged marriage and there's this get to know you period. So the SCI providers know SCI and the vocational providers know the um, practice, but they need to know how each other operates. And so we did a lot of interprofessional education, including sharing outcomes. Um, so I want to take a few moments to talk about some work we were able to do with knowledge translation, um, largely through funding with the Craig H. Nielsen grant, which was a wonderful partner to try to develop some tools so that interested centers and programs could start implementing. So IPS supported employment. So the first grant was to basically develop the con what could be kind of this, what I would say is the starter content of a toolkit. And um, so we did a scoping review. There wasn't, there's not enough established literature to even do a systematic review, just to find out what tools are out there that providers could use on using IPS supported employment with spinal cord injury. Um, so we convened a panel of experts, we reviewed the literature, we brought um, of almost 18, a little over 1800 articles, we brought 24 of the table to our panel of experts, which included vocational experts as well as um, IPS supported employment experts and um, veterans and non-veterans and um, persons with lived experience. And of those, 16 were considered on target. 
um, for including in uh, what I could say was maybe version one or a starter toolkit. Um, so basically what it was was just a compilation of resources and it was a good starting point, but we knew that this was probably not gonna be particularly useful. And so we were able fortunately to secure a second grant <clears throat> through the Craig H. Nielsen Foundation um, to do a formative evaluation of a toolkit with the interdisciplinary team at the Heinz VA implementing the toolkit and getting feedback from them in order to improve it. So this was a participatory iterative approach. Um, we convened the um, Heinz spinal cord injury SCI providers at a kickoff kind of orientation meeting about the practice as well as the starter toolkit and asked them to just try it out and give us some feedback. Then we did qualitative interviews with the providers. We brought that data back to a second steering committee. Um, and then we developed the version two. Um, fortunately with the funding, we were able to get some um, other graphics and knowledge translation help. And um, we worked also with the IPS Employment Center to refine the materials and brought it back to the SCI providers. So it was sort of a, iterative process where we were continually refining and bringing it back to them and making sure that we hit the mark, if you will. Um, so as a result of that, what resulted was a um, practical, real-world, um, evidence-based information on the best practices for addressing um, some of the gaps in SVI rehab um, with use of this model. Um, so the way that this is organized is um, it's essentially any inter interdisciplinary team member can just go to a particular spot based on their need or the goal of the patient in front of them, or they could work their way through it in more of a linear fashion. So it includes everything from about IPS and SCI to integrating vocational and medical rehabilitation, um, the evidence for IPS, bringing a specialist on board. Um, and a little peek under the hood, it has forms and templates that can be downloaded. It has videos as well as the content and links that people can go to for a deeper dive. Um, and what we also did was, um, since we knew that success stories were, were part of the, the um, what we found to be successful in implementing IPS, we included success stories at the front of each chapter um, and identified them with icons to illustrate which particular principle that sex sex story exemplifies. So it was not just about telling a story of a positive outcome, although that was powerful in and of itself, but it was also what were the active ingredients? What did the team do? What did the veteran do? How did they, how do we get to that outcome? And we include templates in the toolkit for people to develop their own success stories and share them in their own teams because we really just believed that was a very powerful way to diffuse this particular practice. Um, I want to share a little bit about fidelity monitoring because that's another important key to implementation. Um, that's that quality assurance process to make sure that you're delivering the model in a way that is providing high quality services that are basically on point with the principles. Um, so um, the way this works is the supported employment fidelity scale is a 25 item instrument that measures the degree of adherence to the eight principles. It's organized into three categories, staffing that looks at things like caseload size, organization, um, and services. And the way that um, it's conducted is the person that's, or, or team that's doing the fidelity review will look at the medical charts, interview the um, client, the staff and employers, and then provide feedback on the strengths and weaknesses of the program. And we were fortunate enough to be able to include fidelity monitoring when we did the field test of the toolkit um, in Heinz. And um, very nicely, fidelity increased over time, even 
during this very short time span that we were there to work on the toolkit together in partnership with them. Um, little example of how this looks. Um, so this is an example that focused on organizational changes to improve integration of services. Um, in year one, the employment space specialist basically had minimal interaction with the SCI providers to discuss goals and wasn't included in the meetings. Actions were recommended and leadership got involved and promoted integration of services. Um, and also they created some extra meetings in order to discuss employment cases and SCI care simultaneously. And at year two, the employment specialist was routinely included in the meetings and there was shared decision-making and that was reflected in the electronic health record as well. Um, this slide is showing that even in this um, kind of small sample over this short period of time, as fidelity improved, employment outcomes and referrals improved too. Um, so they go hand in hand. So I wanna switch gears just a little bit here and mention customized employment. Um, which is another vocational rehabilitation approach uh, defined as a flexible process designed to personalize the employment relationship between a job seeker and an employer in a way that meets the needs of both. Um, so um, one of the distinguishing features of customized employment, which um, was of interest in the VA, but not implemented in the VA, is that it may have an opportunity, there may be an opportunity to use this with medically complex patients that take longer to find employment because customized employment includes a discovery feature, which is basically an extended period of time of discovering the person's interests and skills and support needs prior to the job search. So it's kind of, in, though it includes some of the similar processes of IPS, the approach is a little bit different and um, kind of how it's organized in terms of what comes first is a little bit different. Um, so um, where are we at with customized employment in the field? Um, I can uh, call your attention to an editorial in the Journal of Vocational Rehabilitation by Dr. Wayman on supported employment and customized employment that talks about the impact and very nicely describes where we're at with customized employment. Basically, it shows promise. It's not yet an evidence-based practice. Um, studies are basically not well-defined, small sample sizes, and there's not um, enough RCTs yet to establish that. So more research is needed. For the sake of time, I'm gonna go through these. Um, more research is needed to specify the practices, understand, how discovery might result in improvements in retention and understand how we need to train customized employment providers better and how do we use social networks. So we were fortunate enough to get um, another VA merit grant to do an RCT to look at customized employment versus IPS supported employment. It's called the Access Vets Trial and um, I'd like to acknowledge my team members that are participating. Um, this is the methods paper, and so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on methods other than to say what we're trying to do is establish if this might be an effective practice in our setting in, in uh, VHA, particularly with spinal cord. Um, again, look at quality of life and participation. But what we really want to know too is in adapting customized employment, what is what works in IPS and what works in customized employment to address barriers. Um, so in terms of design, it's a randomized trial over 12 months with mixed methods. I wanna get on to, so I'm not gonna spend a lot of time here because I don't have, um, it's ongoing. We have 35 people enrolled. Um, the sample demographics are very similar to previous studies. So I won't spend time there. Um, we have a variety of different injury characteristics enrolled as well. So. We just have a beginning sample now. We don't have information to share yet, but it'll be interesting to see whether this might fill a niche and boost outcomes either even further than the IPS practice. So in the time remaining, I want to say a little bit about traumatic brain injury and employment. This is not my main area of focus, but often because of the work that I've done in SCI, I've been pulled in this direction. Um, 
So I think, as you all know, uh, TBI is an alteration in brain functioning. Um, <clears throat> 70 to 80 percent cases are characterized as mild. Most survivors are many, at least, are working age. And like SCI, there's a host of negative health outcomes with accompanying cognitive difficulties, which naturally pose barriers to employment. Also like SCI, predominantly male, um, 1.5 million Americans sustain a TBI each year, up to 90,000 people experience the long-term consequences. Um, from 2000 to 2021, 450,000 US service members were diagnosed. And I think quite clearly the um, recent conflicts and activities have of course, called a heightened interest for the VA in um, developing appropriate treatments um, to facilitate rehab outcomes in TBI. So the major contrast between the populations is probably etiology with um, fall being pr more predominant in the civilian population and violence being more predominant in the SCI population, um, which could result from um, blasts um, and other military consequences. Uh, the literature says that about 29 to 46 percent of persons with SC, uh, TBI, excuse me, return to work. Um, there's mixed findings regarding work trajectories. In some studies, they improved. In some studies, they deteriorated. But more positive outcomes do seem to be associated with higher education, younger age, male gender white race or ethnicity and pre-injury employment, which are the same factors for, um, in general, in employment studies. Um, there was a recent scoping review of return to work after TBI, and um, 23 studies met their inclusion criteria of being um, studies of vocational rehabilitation with moderate to severe TBI populations. Um, however, they cited there is a lack of comparison groups among most studies, and only three of these 23 studies included military populations, only one of which was a population of U.S. veterans. So the authors concluded that development of return to work interventions is neglected in both civilian and veteran populations. They did point out some general factors associated with return to work success. Um, they include gains in education during rehabilitation, higher spending on rehabilitation services, shorter time in vocational rehab services, access to workplace supports, and shorter residential rehab stays. And the implications for rehab is promoting interdisciplinary integrated approach to vocational rehab. That sounds familiar. I certainly would concur there. Using interventions that promote on-site training and workplace integration and tailoring interventions based on the features of the TBI. All of that makes good sense. So I want to say a few words to about the um, Veterans Health Administration polytrauma system of care. So it's somewhat similar in that it covers the entire U.S. Um, the, <clears throat> the polytrauma rehabilitation centers, which are represented by the larger blue dots, are located in Minneapolis, Palo Alto, Richmond, San Antonio, and Tampa. And they serve as regional referral centers for comprehensive acute um, inpatient rehabilitation. Uh, next, the polytrauma network sites focus on outpatient services, but they also do have some inpatient beds um, and maintain a full range of rehabilitation professionals to address TBI. There are also support clinics um, throughout that provide outpatient, excuse me, outpatient interdisciplinary rehab care for veterans and service members. And then there's polytrauma points of contact that have a more limited range of rehabilitation services. In 2017, the National Program Office gathered a meeting of um, experts in polytrauma and vocational care for a um, summit, if you will, on um, 
looking at vocational rehabilitation in the polytrauma system of care. And while polytrauma does include other things besides TBI, TBI is essentially the leading um, hallmark injury there. Um, so this basically was a um, meeting that looked at some of the challenges of providing vocational services to veterans with polytrauma. Staffing certainly led the way. Um, navigating benefits was seen as something that was um, kind of difficult territory to navigate, particularly if the veteran or the provider was unfamiliar. Um, the next two kind of go hand in hand. Um, the population treats a transitioning um, caseload of active duty veterans uh, with very heterogeneous needs due to injury, etiologies, and comorbidities. And oftentimes they're not staying at the place that they're receiving rehab, they're going home to a distant location, which can make providing community vocational rehabilitation quite challenging um, and communicating and collaborating across disciplines or services challenging. So some general strategies um, developed by expert consist consensus, if you will, were as focusing on services, communities, and teams. So increasing access to services was deemed a priority, um, particularly designing flexible services based on individual needs, having full use of that continuum of services offered by CWT um, to meet those needs, and partnering with the compensated work therapy service to provide those supports. Trying to foster related relationships with the communities the veterans are going to through outreach and partnerships and use of tele-rehabilitation. That was before COVID um, and uh, certainly should be easier now. And then um, focusing if staffing is, if, if you can't just hire someone, what can you do with the existing team to improve the knowledge base and skills and trying to work with staffing resources to get those critical physicians um, filled eventually. So back to um, some of the recommendations from our scoping review, where should the research go um, in TBI? Um, more exper authors recommended that more experimental designs rather than quasi-experimental or correlational studies are needed, um, particularly a focus on prospective repeated measures and longitudinal designs, um, definitely looking at race and ethnicity and studies with military as a special population who um, have a higher risk of TBI and distinct characteristics. So um, certainly um, veterans and non-veterans with SCI or TBI have unique challenges and barriers to employment. There's no denying that they're multifaceted. And I think that everything that we can do to reduce those barriers by trying to use evidence-driven approaches is well worth the time and the effort um, to help people achieve their maximum functioning and social inclusion and participation following these injuries. Just wanna take a moment to thank my research study team members and acknowledge them, <clears throat> the current ones as well as um, from press, past studies, the support of the VHA program offices in SCI and Voc Rehab, so that top leadership support for research has been critical, especially when you're trying to link it with policy. And um, our veteran participants and my postdoc for contributing to the TBI content on this presentation. So, all right. I think my time has come to a close for content and I'm happy to entertain to take some questions. Thank you, Lisa. Um... I don't see any questions in the chat. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Adamanelli? Hi, Dr. Adamanelli. Um, my name is Miriam Rafferty and I'm a physical therapy researcher here. And most of my work is in Parkinson's disease. And I was, I was brought into the employment research space through the great work of, um, of this grant and, CROR, in part because my PT patients were asking me about employment and I didn't know the answer. So I started doing some studies in Parkinson's and voc rehab. And so I'm really interested how you've kind of also kind of gone from in, in a different way from spinal cord injury to brain injury to this in the individualized service kind of that you were studying. And I'm wondering how generalizable do you think that this type of model 
is for rehabilitation. Do you feel like it's something that works really well and would work equally well with kind of degenerative conditions or different types of um, disabilities like low back pain and long COVID and things like that? Or do you think that we really have to think about those types of chronic conditions differently than a traumatic experience? That's a great question. Um, so I think there's, I think there's probably several questions in there. So let me see if I can unpack that. Um, so, you know, my, my colleague and partner, um, uh, Dr. Lance Getz used to like to point out that the IPS supported employment model theoretically is disability neutral. So theoretically, yes, it should work with a population that has a complex disability, whether it's a mental health disability or a physical disability or otherwise. And, you know, I think a lot of our populations, you know, they're, they don't have one or the other anyway, they, they have multiple comorbidities usually. Um, and I think that the, I think the, the total package is probably the strongest package. So I do think that if you are employing those eight principles faithfully, um, that you will, you will see positive outcomes. I think that you certainly do need to adapt to, you need to know your population and that's where your expertise with Parkinson's or whatever you're adapting it for comes into play. Um, and I also think that probably there's some variance based on the availability of team members that you may need to address the barriers that your particular um, person with that given Dis disability presents with. And um, so low back pain, I don't know how much of an integrated treatment team someone with low back pain might have. But if somebody was receiving some type of outpatient rehab for say Parkinson's or something, maybe they have a team that consists of several disciplines that you could draw on to help address the barriers. Um, because I think where we saw the best outcomes was where the VOC specialist had the ability to um, rely on the strength of their team members to address accommodations or um, changes in medication schedules or anything else that needed to be um, modified, adapted, or reinforced to um, both place somebody in a job successfully as well as scope the job appropriately and help them retain the job. Great, thank you. I have a question. Yes. So with, with your veterans, if, if they've been injured, whether it's a spinal cord injury or a traumatic brain injury, they often get uh, veterans benefits for that, right? And they're financially based. Now, when you try to have people uh, become employed again, how does that affect their benefits? That is a great question. So um, I probably should have pointed this out, but... Um, so most of the, so benefits count, I did mention that benefits counseling is included. Um, mm -hmm. And um, I, most of the, so the veterans basically have a decision to make about, you know, how, you know, how, what kind of employment do they want? Do they want full-time employment? Do they want part-time employment? What, what is their, their goal? Um, and so they may decide that they want to maintain their, benefits um, and just work part-time at a level that they're not going to risk losing them. Um, most of the veterans in our first study, 85% of them worked part-time. What was interesting is that even working a few hours a week, we still saw positive quality of life changes, right? Sure. right? So, um, and what, what, the other thing that was interesting, okay. I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to interrupt briefly. So do you find that some veterans uh, and as I'm assuming they would tell you this, often get under the table cash from working so that they can work more, but they're not, they don't have to report the income from those jobs. Well, um, I think sometimes, yes, of course, I think sometimes veterans may do that. Some people may do that. Um, we don't count that as a, as an employment outcome. Um, so all we counted as an employment outcome was if they were um, being paid at least minimum wage, you know, um, 
So, you know, our goal was not necessarily to get people off disability roles. It was to improve overall rehabilitation outcomes with employment basically being like a therapy, if you will. Um, and a lot of our veterans are in a receive benefits that are not income dependent. So veterans who are service connected um, receive a substantial amount of money sometimes if it's a spinal cord injury, to, if they're hundred percent service connected. And um, some of them still wanna work just because they wanna do something besides watch television, sit at home like the rest of us, right? Um, and then some of them are okay and they're like, no, that's, I'm good. So it's just such an individual decision. Thank you. Other questions? Lisa, I know in one of your slides, you talked about um, sort of looking maybe at long-term um, outcomes. Uh, have you looked at how long people stay employed once they get um, the service and get a, get a job? Are, are you keeping track of like how long they stay at that particular job? Um, so um, we did in this we did in the second study, and I don't have that data right off the top of my head. Um, but um, the longest we went in the second study was up to two years. So we haven't done any like you know five year look back, ten year look back. I think that would be great. And that you know I think that uh, in general, um, you know that's kind of the next level we need to we need to go is look at retention and also look at the the quality of jobs. Um, so those are two areas where I think the research could be improved. Great. Anything else? All right, well, we're very close to the top of the hour. Um, if you are interested in the uh, continuing education for the vocational rehabilitation specialists, um, please complete the evaluation. You can send an email to Angelica Kudla, or you can look at the uh, link in the chat. Um, but we are very pleased today to have Lisa Adamanelli here as part of our 2023 uh, Nidler Invited Lecturer and look forward to continued work with her. Thank you, Lisa. Thanks, Thank you Lisa. for having me. Bye. Bye-bye.